Let's talk about the EPR paradox. And I've noticed that most discussions of the EPR paradox and the EPR arguments kind of miss the mark here. And I'm not going to blame anyone for misrepresenting the EPR paradox, the EPR paper, uh, because the EPR paper itself is like really really poorly written. It's not the greatest paper in the history of science, even though it is, I believe, the most highly cited paper in all of physics now. Um, anyway, EPR stands for Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen. So this is Einstein working with a couple collaborators after he moved to Princeton uh, to escape the Nazi regime in Germany. And the reason it's not very well written, Einstein was a great science writer. He was an excellent communicator. He had such clarity of arguments, like every paper he wrote was boom, boom, boom. You can follow it. It's great. Uh, but for this particular paper, um, he wanted it to be written in English. He was a he was in Princeton, after all, uh, and he didn't believe that his own English was up to snuff for writing the technical details of a paper, so he left it to his two collaborators, Podolsky and Rosen, to write it. And then as soon as it was published, he admitted in a letter to Schrodinger that, yeah, I let them write it because English is their first language, it's not mine, um, but I don't really like how the paper came out, and I would have written it differently if, if I could have written it in German. But that's that's the way it is. Here's, here's the EPR paradox and, and the story that the EPR paper tells. Um, I'll tell you that story and then I'll tell you what Einstein was actually trying to get at. So the EPR paradox looked at the phenomenon of entanglement, where you take two quantum particles, you bring them close together, you let them get all intimate, close to each other, you know, they know each other, go on a few dates, and then you separate them. When you separate them, these two particles now share a single quantum state, a single wave function that describes both particles simultaneously. So you can't describe one or the other independently anymore. They are now uh, linked entities in the cosmos. Uh, what happens to one affects, in a in a very broad sense, what happens to the other. And measurements on one give you instant, instantaneous information about the other because they share a single unified state regardless of distance. So Einstein said, let's take two particles, let's bring them together, let's entangle them, and then let's separate them. Now I'm going to take this particle, let's call it particle A, and I'm going to very precisely measure its position. Knowing its position, because these particles are now entangled, I now also know the position of the second particle. Because guess what entanglement does? It gives you information about that distant particle, no matter how far away it is. And then I'll wait a while. Now I'm going to measure the momentum of this first particle. Boom! Measure the position, and then later measure its momentum. I can do these because these are separate processes. I can measure these as precisely as I want. And now I have instantaneous information about particle B, the second particle, and I know its position and its momentum as accurately as I want, which violates the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which tells us that you can't know a particle's position and momentum as tightly as you want, as, as much as you want, that there's a fundamental limit to measuring those two quantities in tandem. But look, look, I didn't even have to go visit particle 2. It lives in another zip code. I didn't even have to call or text it, and I was able to get its precise position and momentum in violation of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So, in this paper, Einstein says either you have to give up the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, or you have to give up the idea of entanglement. You can't have both. Niels Bohr, great physicist, uh, took on the task of responding to the EPR paper. And he wrote a paper a few months later, submitted it to the exact same journal, and took the very sassy move of using the exact same title, which I believe was, uh, Can Quantum Mechanics Provide a Complete Description of Nature, or something like that. Used the exact same title. So, so sassy. And basically said, well, no, it's more complicated than that. You see, when you measure the position of particle A, this affects particle A. So now it's a new system so that when you go to measure, um, 
the, its momentum later on, it's a different particle. So, so you're not violating the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Case closed. So on the face of it, it looks like Einstein is trying to show a flaw in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, a flaw in quantum mechanics based on the uncertainty principle. I said, look, I found a way to get out of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And then on the surface, it looks like Bohr is saying, oh, no, 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 Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It's more complicated than that. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. But that wasn't Einstein's point. That wasn't what Einstein was going after. He wasn't trying to attack the uncertainty principle. He was trying to attack entanglement. He was trying to point out that quantum mechanics is flawed because it allows non-locality. Einstein was saying, if you want quantum mechanics to be correct, and you want to say the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is true, which is a part of the quantum mechanics description of nature, then there is a major flaw, non-locality. I can know instantaneously the properties of this particle, no matter how far away it is. It could be across the lab. It could be across the country. It could be in the Andromeda galaxy. And somehow I'm able to know about it and influence and affect it because of this quantum phenomenon of entanglement. And Bohr basically said, yeah, no, non-locality is a thing. Quantum mechanics is non-local. Moving on. So it looks like Bohr won because he was able to rescue the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, show that there wasn't a violation. But that wasn't the point of the EPR paper and why it was poorly written, because that wasn't Einstein's point. He wasn't attacking the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. He was attacking entanglement. He believed that physics should be local. He believed that what happens in the laboratory stays in the laboratory. That if I make a measurement or an observation or an experiment on a, low, a physical system right in front of me, all that should matter is the physical system that's right in front of me. That this whole non-locality thing of quantum mechanics where two particles influence each other across vast distances instantaneously violated everything else we know about physics because all other physical laws are fully local. Einstein set his career on developing local laws of physics. And he said it violates even common sense. If I run an experiment and I get a result, if physics is local, if, if what happens inside of my experimental apparatus or everyday experience only depends on what I can control in the experiment, then I can control the experiment. I can know the outcome. I can make predictions. I can do science. But if there's this weird non-local entanglement throughout the universe and like an electron in the Andromeda galaxy farts and then somehow that influences the experimental result that I'm going to get, well, how can I trust my experimental result? How can I trust physics itself? How can I get anything done if the universe is non-local? Einstein said this was crazy, and he used the EPR paradox to show that quantum mechanics was insane, and he wasn't buying it, and that it was missing something. And Bohr basically said, yeah, it's crazy, bud. What are you going to do about it? But Einstein's main objections stood. It does appear that quantum mechanics is non-local. We see it all the time. We have experimental verification of the non-locality of quantum mechanics. Einstein never liked this. He believed until his dying breath that quantum mechanics was incomplete and that the appearance of non-locality, the appearance of entanglement was the number one dysfunction of this theory. Since then, we've simply grown used to it, even though we can't explain how it works. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe, and go to patreon.com slash pmsutter to keep supporting this show.